Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to a rapid introduction to web accessibility. Uh, my name is Michael Head. I'm a solution architect at a consulting company named Slalom. I'm a certified web accessibility specialist and trusted tester. Trusted tester is an accessibility certification the US federal government provides. I'll touch on it a little bit later. Um, and since this is a short session, we'll jump right in. Here's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll define web accessibility, go over some assistive technologies, and then we'll discuss prioritizing, measuring, and uh, building uh, accessible web interfaces. I'll have my contact information at the end, and it's in the chat if you want to get in touch to ask questions later. So what is web accessibility? Here's one definition for web accessibility. Uh, websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I think, I believe this comes from the WCAG guidelines. Uh, I've broadened it here a little bit um, because I think it warrants um, integrating accessibility into user experience design and development. So my version is making user interfaces usable for the widest possible combination of users and contexts as is feasible. So this is illustrated by this graphic on the right, which is from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit. Um, is weak, uh, disabilities can range from permanent disabilities, someone having one arm, temporary, to temporary disabilities, an arm injury, to sort of uh, contextual disabilities of holding uh, groceries in one arm, a baby in one arm, you only have the ability to use that one arm during that time. So interfaces built for those kinds of situations help people in all those instances, not just folks that are um, what you might say traditionally disabled. Um, well, well, let's look at a, another real world example that we may not normally think of in terms of accessibility. So most people can probably read that the, the top line um, but can, can you read the second line or the third line? Um, if you have glasses or contacts and you took those out, could you read the same lines then? If you couldn't, would you be considered disabled? Aren't glasses and contacts assistive technology? Here's an example where we have to consider font size and color contrast for the sake of legibility. Uh, the context also matters though. On a larger screen or printed out, these may be perfectly legible but viewing in a poorly lit room may make it hard to read, plus your own eyesight matters. So it's usability within a particular context. In this case, these lines get progressively worse with regards to accessibility compliance as we go from top to bottom. The first line passes uh, tr three triple A for WCAG guidelines for any font size. The second line has to be larger text. In this case, it's bold just to pass double A and then the Bottom line fails AA altogether. And we'll get more into the compliance and what that means in, in a little bit. So what does accessibility look like from our user's perspective? It often includes the use of assistive technologies, software or hardware that improves the experience of users with disabilities. Here's a very short list of assistive technologies that users might use to overcome a challenge with using interfaces. It's a very short list because there are many other kinds of software and hardware out there. Uh, screen readers are probably the most well-known in the web community and, and the most prevalent. Most major operating systems ship with some form of screen reader like VoiceOver on Mac OS and Narrator on Windows. There, but then there are also third-party uh, options like JAWS. And then there are even hardware versions of screen readers like a braille reader in the, uh, shown in the lower right hand image. So now we have an idea of what it is, but why would we prioritize web accessibility? So we should, why should we care that we do this work alongside all the other work that we might do? Here are a few reasons to prioritize it. One is to minimize or mitigate risk. The Section 508 of the Americans with Disabilities Act states that federal agencies' electronic and information technology is accessible to people with disabilities, including employees and members of the public. So building an accessible interface ensures we minimize the risk of lawsuits. 
sort of like the one that Target faced and lost to the National Federation of the Blind when their website wasn't usable with a screen reader. However, I do not believe in lawsuit driven development. So let's look at some other reasons we might prioritize it. One is business reach. Limiting the usability of your software limits the reach of it and therefore your business. So if you look at just these two statistics uh, about vision and colorblindness, um, there are only two statistics that are US centric and based on ancestry, but that's a lot of people that you would uh, be limiting access to with your interfaces and therefore your business. So then, and finally, there's the stance that it's the right thing to do based on ethical and professional standards. That's a tricky stance, given it has real impact on budgets and timelines and so forth. But I, I think the wider design and development community is going to continue to make it a higher priority by default in the future. So hopefully it becomes a given. I see it kind of like as security in software systems. It's slowly becoming more and more of a default instead of an afterthought. So how do we make sure that we're making things accessible on the web? Well, there are two sets of guidelines a designer or developer can use in order to determine either um, how they should build a new user interface or evaluate what they have built for an existing interface. We'll spend more time on the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, as these apply to the widest range of web applications and websites. ATAG, the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, applies to a specific class of web apps, those kinds of applications that build web content, such as content management systems, HTML editors, or other kinds of tools. So let's look a little bit at WCAG. The WCAG guidelines, which is one of those funny acronyms that people say like pin number, where you repeat the last letter again, fall, uh, those guidelines fall into four categories that have the nifty acronym of POUR, P-O-U-R. So it's, it's too much to fit into a short talk or one slide. So if you Google the quick ref for WCAG, it'll have a really good overview for uh, each of these, but we will go over each of them in turn at a high level. So perceivable, information must be perceivable by the user. For example, an image that is crucial to filling out a form that doesn't have alternative text means folks using screen readers will never get the content needed to fill out the form. That content is not perceivable to them. Here's an example where we have a form on the left-hand side and uh, uh, pretend that city is required, that text is actually in an image, but an image that doesn't have any alternative text. So a user with a screen reader won't actually know that city is a required field. And they might fill out the entire form and then submit it, get an error and just decide to bail. So that, that uh, requirement for that form is not perceivable to them. Operable. Interactive elements, oops, sorry, interactive elements have to be operable by the user. For example, uh, we, here we have a button made out of a div element. Um, by default, when you roll your own UI elements like this, you have to code all the stuff that normal HTML elements give you for free. Keyboard focus, handling clicks, key presses, etc. In this case, by default, this button doesn't receive focus from a keyboard. So users that use only keyboards can't activate it. It's effectively inoperable to them. Um, funny slash sad side note, six connects appears to make all their buttons out of divs. So um, I would like to talk with the all things open staff next year about what we could do to maybe pick a more accessible uh, platform. Uh, understandable information and operation of the interface has to be understandable to users. For example, if a form doesn't identify which fields are in error when a user submits the form, users won't understand what is wrong and they won't know what needs to be fixed. In this case, they have to guess what is the error and it's, it's not understandable. And finally, robust. Content must be robust enough to work with a wide variety of user agents. Uh, so in this example, or for example, without the correct semantics in markup, some screen readers don't know how to read the content. Here we have some invalid markup that represents a list, uh, but using divs instead of list items. So it might render okay in a browser, 
but a screen reader won't know how to parse this as a list uh, uh, and would give unknown results for a screen reader user. So POUR, P-O-U-R, represents the high level principles. In each of these principles, we have many granular guidelines. We can't go into every guideline now, but we'll look at some examples for the guidelines of distinguishable, which is inside of perceivable. Compliance with WCAG is measured in levels A, AA, and AAA. Each guideline is associated with a particular level. And then, uh, so here's a guideline from each level. And we'll go into each of these. Most organizations strive for adhering to level 2A. So here's an example for the guideline for use of color, level A. We have two versions of a form with some fields, one of which is uh, marked, one of the fields is marked as optional, but only through the color green. The label nickname is optional on the left-hand side, um, only using color to designate that. So colorblind users wouldn't actually know it's an optional field. Uh, conversely, you could think about it if they were all required fields and only use the color to designate they were required, a colorblind user may not get that information. So providing the word optional on the right-hand side uh, resolves this issue by providing something other than the use of color to say that a field is optional. Here for the guideline of minimum contrast, we need a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to one. And the text color that we, the color for the sample text we, we have on the left is too low, 2.84 to one. So it fails for level 2A but we tweak that color and we can bump it up to 5.74 to one and it passes level 2A. Now that may be good enough for the organization's standards that they're going for. There is another level for contrast specifically, 3A, where the previous example would have failed at 5.741 to one, but we bump the color up again or change the color to a different something different that has a higher contrast. And now we have 12.63 to one. This would pass level 3A because it's, its threshold for passing is seven to one. So it depends on the organizations, um, what, got, what level of the guidelines an organization is trying to meet, um, but they, some of them vary between A, AA and AAA as to what you'd have to do to meet that requirement. So now we know what it is as far as web accessibility goes, why we want to build it and have an idea of how to measure, but how do we actually build web accessible web interfaces? So I'll touch on two topics in this section, ARIA and testing tools. So again, not a lot of time to cover a bunch of content, but uh, check out the way area standards guidelines for more information. There are a set of guidelines, a set of standards we can use for building accessible web applications. These let us code our interfaces for use by screen readers and other assistive technologies. Note though that one of its recommendations is that you, if you can avoid using Way Aria or Aria, you should do so. So many things work in browsers out of the box, so to speak, uh, and we should be careful if we start building our own stuff that might not be compliant by default. Sort of uh, that example of if you start building a button out of a div, uh, you have to build it all the way uh, or you should just use a button. Uh, and then before, during and after development, we'll wanna test for adherence to the WCAG guidelines. So here are many tools that are available to do that. So here are, there are some categories with names and links to a, a few of them that are out there. Some are for manual evaluations like uh, color contrast checkers and then others allow for some automated evaluations like web hint and accessibility insights, which I highly recommend having used it on some projects in the past. Browsers even come with some built-in tools these days for doing things like looking at the accessibility ex properties of elements. AXE is an accessibility rule set that you can put into your CI CD pipeline to evaluate components before letting things go to production. Note though, some research shows only about 30% of uh, issues can be found in automated testing. So manual evaluation is still a must. And finally, this was a tour de force of a quick presentation. Why stop learning here? Um, here there are many resources out there from the International Association of Accessibility Professionals to the standards themselves. 
So I think we are right at time. Thank you very much. Uh, here's my contact info and it's in the chat if you have any questions or want to follow up.